Dr. Sophia Satterwhite, founder and CEO of She Heals the World. I'm so happy that you are tuning in to today's episode to hear the top lifestyle and business tips from women entrepreneurs all around the globe. If you found this show helpful, be sure to share it with a friend. That's how our community grows. Today's guest is coming up next. So today I am super excited to have Kate joining us from yourcourageouslife.com. She is a director and most importantly, she's the author of The Courage Habit, How to Accept Your Fears, Release the Past, and Live Your Courageous Life. Kate is here to share her story about how she launched her own school as well as how she became a coach and what it was like to, um, to write her first book. And then after that, she's going to give us some real life tips on how we overcome anxiety. As many of you know, we are in a state right now where uh, the world is panicking and anxiety and emotions are really high. And so there was really no better person to really talk about how to step into courage during this time and overcome anxiety as we're getting all of these things thrown at us. So I'm just really blessed that Kate decided to join us today and share her work and her story and her movement. So Kate, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Totally excited to have you. So tell me, how did you even get started with your brand and with this beautiful work that you're leading? Well, you know, I I think my story is one that a lot of people probably will relate to, maybe not right now because uh, work life has been so disrupted. But, you know, it's the story of the person who is working in the job that is soul sucking. Only I would say in my case, what might be a little bit different is that I it was a job I had actively worked for and gotten all the degrees for and tried to climb the ladder for and all the things. And so I basically was was working at this job, was sitting in a meeting right before we were about to go on break. And it was this, you know, the voiceless voice, the voice of your intuition, whatever you want to call it, that just kind of said, I don't want to do this anymore. And it was like this weird moment sitting in this meeting and feeling a little bit like, can anybody else tell, you know, can anybody else, you know, Uh, because it was like, oh my God, like since when, since when did I not want to do this anymore? Everything I had done in my life up until that point was to be at that job, which I had been at for a couple of years. And it was just, once I heard it, that voice within, I couldn't unhear it. And so then it was, well, what do I want to do? Um, So I did a lot of trying to figure out what it is that I wanted to do. Um, values assessment, skills assessment, online quizzes, what's the best job for me. What I knew was that I was very much, uh, I loved writing, I loved teaching, I loved designing curriculum for workshops and retreats. I had had a a side business as a coach for a bit, but that to me at the time, I just considered a hobby. I thought, I thought I had this idea that to, to be someone who had a successful business, you had to have an MBA or (laughs) I really did think that, like, I really thought you had to have a degree in business to know really how to run a business. Um, And so it just, you know, that experience really just blew me wide open around inquiry. And as I began to understand that, that the fear was not going to go away. And that in fact, the more I was trying to push it away, the the harsher it was really to, to pivot, to change, to do what I needed to do, the more my definition of courage began to develop. And so I, I ultimately arrived at, you know, courage is when we feel afraid, because we're not getting out of that part, we lean into the fear or lean in anyway, because anything else is avoidance and staying stuck. And then we transform. And when we do that, we might only transform an inch. But when we do that, we still transform. So it isn't the absence of fear being fearless. It's about how do we step into courage and and go ahead and embrace the fact that we feel afraid. And that became a pivot point for everything in my life. And it really became a passion of mine to work with people around where they get stuck in fear and start helping them to see ways to become courageous. When I wrote The Courage Habit, it was really exciting to me also, and I'm sure we'll talk about this over the course of the episode, but it was really exciting to me to see that there's research behind the ways in which our behavior becomes habitual and we forget that. And so there are fear-based habits and we can let go of those and we can choose and create courage-based habits. 
And uh, that's been a really exciting development as well. So what happened when you really said, like, I'm going to use my life's work to support myself? You know, what was that transition like? And what hurdles did you experience when getting started? Well, the day I made the decision, I um, was super excited about it. And I went to bed that night, like, oh, my God, this is what I'm going to do. I finally, you know, after all this confusion and indecision, I figured it out. I went to bed that night and I kept jerking awake. Like, you know how you go to sleep sometimes and you just, you know, like, oh, I'm awake. And then you go back to sleep and, <gasps> and you're awake again. And then like the world's worst stomach ache started and I was just sick to my stomach. And I realized in hindsight that all the fear was coming out when I was asleep or trying to sleep. Mm. So that was what it actually felt like at first. And I'm grateful that I didn't make that mean it must mean I shouldn't do this because I know a lot of people do that when they start to experience fear and especially physical symptoms of illness because they're afraid. Mm. So in essence, um, you know, the first thing was I got to just navigate that. And then it started to be okay, like, let me start executing on ideas. And I would say that a big takeaway I would offer to people who are in that starting position is stop waiting until you have it all figured out before you execute. Stop mm. waiting until you think you have it all. Like entrepreneurship is a creative act. And mm. if you talk to a writer or a painter or a sculptor or a dancer, anyone who's creating anything that we typically label artistic or creative, they will tell you that there are crappy first drafts. There are canvases that get painted and then the get painted over completely. There are photos that get deleted from the camera. Like, like, like it does not come out of the gate. Perfect. Stop waiting. Stop thinking, well, I'm going to give myself three weeks to, to really just think about the content I want to no. know, create the content for the love of God. <laughs> Get it out there. And I'm not saying that as a judgment. I'm not saying it as a judgment. I'm saying it because I just see too many people sitting on ideas, thinking about ideas. Oh, I'll carve out some time next week. No get it done. Lock and load, baby. Like, yeah. get yeah. it out. There. Yeah. yeah. When did you know it was time to up level? Well, I've always been a writer. So writing has always been my thing. And I've, actually, if you'd asked me when I was a little girl, what I wanted to do when I grew up was it, the biggest dream of my life was to to get a book deal with a traditional publisher. So the proposal for The Courage Habit um, I actually sent to a couple different agents and publishers over the years, and it was rejected several times. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like I made the decision and then I sent out the proposal and it just worked out. I was rejected several times. Mm -hmm. And every single time that I was rejected, it was like that project just got pushed to the back burner for six to 12 months. And then I'd pull the proposal out again, look at it again, try sending it out again. So it was a couple years of this happening. The ambition was there and the willingness to try was there sometimes between the competing priorities of time and other things I had going on. Mm -hmm. Um, it was, it, it was hard to think about putting time into a passion project that might not pan out. And so it really was a matter of butts in seats, get my butt into the seat and get mm -hmm. her done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. I mean, I'd love to jump into this book, The Courage Habit, because I think that it really is the underpinning to your whole approach and philosophy on overcoming anxiety and overcoming fear. So now that we are where we are, and, um, you know, again, the state of affairs can be one that's quite depressing and anxiety is on the rise. I mean, every, you know, every news article that you read, Psychology Today, they're all talking about the importance of mental health during a time like this. And so can you just talk us through your approach to courage and how that approach can really support people in overcoming senses of fear and anxiety that they have right now? Yeah. Well, I mean, for one thing, the word overcoming, I often encourage people to switch out because I don't think we overcome fear or anxiety. And and for me, worry, stress, anxiety, th this is all just like other words that we use for fear. We're afraid. If you're stressed, you're afraid. Let's call a thing a thing. Boo. Mm -hmm. That's Ayanna Van Zant. I, I love quoting her. <laughs> so, um, 
You know, like it's not going to be overcome. I am afraid as I think about my own situation and all of this, and I am afraid for the people I love and I'm afraid for the people I don't know. And I'm afraid for our society and the ways that this is changing us because it does not look like we are going back to air quotes normal anytime soon. That is not what the current scientific predictions are. So instead of trying to bypass the fear or overcome it, instead, how do we work with it? And what I found is that there are three predominant ways that people try to avoid fear uh, or try to deal with fear. One is avoidance. Another is placating it. So that's kind of like if I can just do life right, I won't be afraid um, or attacking and none of those strategies work in the long term. They work in the short term, maybe like we feel a little bit better after we attack and vent some anger, but like you create scar tissue and you're not proud of yourself later. So it's, it's not a great strategy. Mm-hmm. So instead of approaching fear in the habitual ways, what we want to do is we want to try to notice when we go into fear patterns like perfectionism, people pleasing, self-sabotage, pessimism. And it's not about oh, I'm going to know about the fear pattern and jump to courageous habits. It's, oh, I'm in my fear pattern again, doing it all again, making the mistakes again. And now I'm noticing, okay, what can I choose instead? So from the research I found, there are four predominant things that help people to be more courageous and more emotionally resilient. You can do one of them, but of course, it's helpful to do all of them. Okay, wait. I'm going to stop you right there because I want everybody to write this down. Get your journals, ladies. You are getting some good (laughs) stuff right now. Let's take notes. The research has been done and Kate is here to deliver the goods. Okay, I'm (laughs) ready. This is it. All right. One, access the body. You know, fear is not logical. It's primal. We feel it in the body. So we need to deal with it in the body. So for me, for my money right now, accessing the body is literally making space to sit down and cry. I call it conscious crying because I'm crying with all my fear of what could happen. I'm crying with the the ways that this has already impacted my life. I am crying for the, the deaths and the loss of life. I am crying for the moms out there who are struggling, trying to figure out how they're going to like manage work. And I'm crying for the layoffs. I'm I'm crying for all those things. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm also angry. I mean, you know, and, and like going onto Facebook and arguing with people is not a very effective use of my time, nor is it very helpful. So what I want to do is I want to take that anger and discharge it out, access the body. So screaming into towels, punching pillows, exercise, meditation, something you can pick what you want to do, but something to actually deal with the feelings in the body. So one access the body. I'm glad you mentioned this access the body part and specifically the crying, because I think there's so much of a stigma around women and crying. And I think for many of us who have achieved high levels of success, you know, we have felt like and there has been this notion that crying is a sense of weakness. It's a sign of weakness. And um, and, and I think because of that, women have suppressed that that desire or even that that emotion and have not given themselves permission to let it all out. And so, but what you're saying to us is we got to let that out and it's okay to have a cry day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It brings you to clear thinking is my experience. And, you know, sometimes people don't want to do the crying thing because they feel like, well, I'll get stuck in it. So I'll share that for me personally. Um, and if anybody wants to see this, they can hop onto Spotify and they can see it. Um, I use a playlist of music. It's called Kate Process Work. Mm. Kate Process Work on Spotify. And it starts with like really sad music. And that's because I, you know, it's not like I I can flip a switch and just like, oh, think of sad things. You'll cry. No, no. The music helps. So when I when I listen to the sadder music, it helps me to just go into the sadness and the music gradually changes to music that's more help, happy and upbeat so that I can end that practice with maybe dancing, laughing, 
um, or just kind of reconnecting to a sense of hope. So the idea is that you're treating it kind of like a meditation session. You know, people meditate for 20 minutes, say, and they set a timer and they sit down and they watch the breath for 20 minutes. I treat this like a meditation also. Only my meditation is, you know, sitting down, listening to the playlist and crying it out or screaming into a pillow. And then when the happier music comes on, really intentionally shifting my focus to gratitude or what what is working or whatever I can that's more hopeful. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that is how I'm accessing the body these days. So the next piece, um, it would be listening without attachment. So you listen to what the fear says instead of trying to tune it out or tell it to shut up or try to reason with it, which are things we do with the voices in our heads, right? That internal critic, we try to ignore it. I see coaches who encourage their clients to write letters telling their fear to F off, mm. uh, you know, placate it, like just tell the fear, what's the worst that could happen and remind the fear that it's all, you know, it's not that those things can't ever be useful. It's just that those are all ineffective strategies in the long term. So instead, listen without attaching to the fear as truth. So what I mean by that is I'm sitting here now and I'm hearing the voice of fear because um, this COVID situation has just, my husband and I were in the process of moving to another state and we sold our home and we're like, great, and on this date, we'll move to another state. This is what we'll do. This is where we'll live. Our housing fell through. We, we don't know where we're going to be living with a kid yeah. in five weeks. Yeah. So my fear can tell me, oh, my God, what if you can't find a place? What if you did? You know, and it's like, OK, instead of ignoring that or instead of trying to go, oh, just calm down, which is kind of like placating it or instead of attacking my fear and telling, shut up, I can't hear that right now. Mm -hmm. You know, like like it doesn't help. So instead, OK, let me sit down. Let me slow down. Fear. Listen without attachment. The fear is that we won't have somewhere to live. Mm -hmm. And let me just recognize that re possible reality. I don't know. It's all up in the air. Here it is. This is the fear. And, and to me, there's something very calming about that. I often pair that with the third part of the courage habit process, which is reframing limiting stories. Because I, you know, I don't know about other people, but I want to kind of do something with the fear that comes up. Like, okay, I've listened. I'm not attaching to it as truth. I'm not making, because I'm having the thought of fear that we might not land with somewhere to live in our new place, in our new city. Um, I'm not attaching to that as truth. Oh, this is just how it's going to be because of coronavirus. I don't know how it's going to be. I'm just listening to what the fear is saying. Then I'm reframing limiting stories. Mm -hmm. So a reframe would be, well, we lost the housing that we had. And what if there's not something else that uh, we like? It's like, well, I'd rather have a roof over my head than live in a car. So maybe I can handle living somewhere that isn't my ideal for a while. Mm. Or maybe this means that, you know, my husband and I, ultimately, we're going to stick with the same city. But my husband and I have had moments of going, maybe it's time to move to a new city. Yeah. You know, it's like if I lived anywhere where, um, you know, I'm, I'm leaving the San Francisco Bay Area, which is very expensive. And we yeah. had already made these plans. But, you know, if, if, if anybody listening to this, if you're living someone re somewhere really, really expensive, maybe this is going to be the thing that actually has you move to a small town where houses are twenty five thousand dollars and you guys could buy a house outright and uh, be shelter in place and have no mortgage and maybe you'd be okay. I mean, I don't know. I'm just like yeah. throwing it out and there. The like space. let's reframe <laughs> what's possible. Maybe yeah. a new possibility is what you need to consider right now. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth part of the courage habit process. So we've got access to the body, listen without attachment, reframe limiting stories, fourth part, reach out and create community. And I am really glad to report that community does not have to be in person. And I've been saying this for a while, and it's more important than ever. Like all of you listening to this podcast episode, by choosing to listen to a podcast episode that is aligned with your values, that is saying, here's what's possible for you, 
that is saying, let's all come together and try to think about how we can get through this. That is a form of creating community. Yeah. So yes, of course, we need the in-person connection and that is something we're limited in at the moment. And yeah, Zoom call doesn't feel as great as a hug with your best friend. I get it. But you do the best you can with what you've got. And the more you can reach out and create community and surround yourself with positive people who are trying to do the best they can with what we've got, the more you are, in fact, creating that community around you, even if it's virtual. And I realize, too, reciting all this, please, everybody, I realize how sanctimonious it might be interpreted as being. I'm, I'm not trying to be like, oh, look at me and all my great habits. I'm just mm-hmm. trying to put pull the point together that... You know, these habits came out of thin air. It's not like I was born knowing to do any of these things. I didn't have stellar parenting (laughs) in these areas, actually. I've done my time in therapy. I've been suicidal. At one point, I had an eating disorder and and did clinical self-harm, cutting, uh, you know, um, serious clinical depression and anxiety, adjustment issues, all kinds of stuff. I've had to build my happiness one block at a time and having put the effort in to build that wall, it started to become part of who I am. And the big thing I would want people to really realize is this moment right here is a great moment to start deciding who you want to choose to be. Mm. You know, this is very fertile ground for you to decide because if, because if you can choose who you want to be, Amid this, if you can choose to be someone who's going to stop abusing yourself internally with the critic, harming yourself by avoiding the things that would make you feel better, if you're going to choose to then go, today I'm going to cry because I needed to cry, or I'm yeah. going to take I'm going to take a walk, a socially distanced walk, but a walk, yeah. if yeah. that's saving your community. If today is going to be the day you're going to stop isolating and start reaching out and creating community. Every single moment you get to choose, moment to moment to moment. You don't choose in this moment, don't beat yourself up over it. You get another moment and it's happening now. Now's a new moment. Do you want to choose now? Oh, you didn't choose now? You get another moment. You see how this goes. Yeah, yeah. Kate, these tips have been so life-changing and I know that they are really designed to pick someone up right now, you know, someone who may not have found their person to give them the right language or the right process to really step more into a more fuller, courageous life. And so I would love to know from you as the expert in this field, if you could look back and give your younger self any piece of advice, what would that be? I think I would hug her and I would hold her close and let her know that it's okay to soften because, you know, if, if anybody hears any righteousness in my voice now, you know, take that and multiply it times a million. At one point I was just so angry. Mm -hmm. I was just so angry and furious with the world for not working out the way I'd hoped it would and furious at myself for not doing it better, big perfectionistic stuff. I would really just want to hug the person that I was before and let her know it's okay. You're safe to soften Um, because the softening and the willingness to go, yeah, I'm tender and I'm afraid I'm sensitive. I don't have it all figured out. That has ended up being a source of great resilience. And I think it's when we're stuck in those spaces of trying so hard to hold it all together you know, we think that if we let go and we admit that we don't have the answers, that we need to cry, that we need support, you know, all those things, that we need to actually step into some sovereignty and take some responsibility for the lives we're living too, you know, um, there, there's a way in which um, we, we end up in a better place. And I, I really would have wanted that. And at the same time, it's 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 like it all happened how it needed to happen to be here right now so you know like oprah says i wouldn't take anything for my journey now you know i'll quote oprah That's yeah okay. i mean yeah i'm with quoting the queen <laughs> <laughs> i love oprah <laughs> our audience side and support you Kate you have amazing work coming I mean I totally want to drop the link to your book and everything else that you're doing but what's the best place that they can go to find and connect with you 
Well, there's yourcourageouslife.com, and there's a whole library of free worksheets, audios, etc. for subscribers. And then there's the Courageous Living Coach Certification, which is at teamclcc.com. So that's T-E-A-M-C-L-C-C.com. Beautiful. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Kate, and I can't wait to have you back. Thank you. Well, there you have it. Thanks so much for listening to the show today. And as always, for more resources, as you continue to live out your beautiful mission of healing the world and grow your beautiful business, you can head to www.shehealstheworld.com forward slash freebie to see what new resources I have in store for you. Thanks for listening. Tell a friend. And I can't wait to see you at the next episode.